Hello everyone. On this video, we will be looking at the relationship between differentiability and continuity. Alright, so if you remember on the previous videos, we covered if a function is differentiable and we covered whether or not it's continuous. But now we'll look at how that relates to each other. Alright, so before we get started, just a quick reminder that a function is differentiable at x equals a if the limit f of x minus f of a all over x minus a as x approaches a equals f prime of a exists. All right, oh, let me clean that up a little bit so it's not as messy looking there. All right, f prime of a. Okay. Now, this could be the same as saying f of x plus h minus f of x all over h as h approaches zero. That's the same thing. You'll see it written different ways. Oh, I had to kind of focus it a little bit. All right, so this is going to lead us right into our theorem. Okay, so let's say if a function... is differentiable. So instead of writing that out again, I'll just write my differentiable like that. So if it's differentiable at x equals a, then the function f, we'll call the function f, I forgot to put the f there, is continuous. at x equals a. So just kind of put the f right there. All right, so all we have to do now is prove that that's true. Okay, so our proof. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is we have to show how we know whether or not it's continuous. So to show a function is continuous at x equals a. Uh -oh. We have to show that the limit of f of x as x approaches a is equal to f of a. Alright, so we do that by first looking at what's given to us. It's given to us that the function is differentiable. So f is differentiable at x equals a. So that means that f prime of a equals the limit of f of x minus f of a all over x minus a as x approaches a actually exists. Okay, doesn't tell us anything else about it, doesn't tell us what the limit is, it just tells us that it actually exists. Alright, so, what if we let that f of x minus f of a equals f of x minus f of a all over x minus a times x minus a. Alright. 
So what if we take the limit of both sides? Okay, so we have the limit of f of x minus f of a as x approaches a equals the limit of f of x minus f of a all over x minus a times x minus a as x approaches a. Okay, so technically we just multiplied it by 1 over here, so. Alright, so if we remember the limit properties or the limit laws, we can see that we can distribute this limit to both of those factors. So that means this will now equal the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a all over x minus a times the limit as x approaches a of x minus a. Alright, so we see already that this, remember, that's equal to your derivative f prime of a. But we see here that this limit, if you use direct su substitution and replace the x with a, that's the limit of a minus a or the limit of zero. So the limit of a constant is just that constant. So the limit of zero is just zero. Okay. So we can see there that zero times anything will just give us zero. All right, so that shows us that the limit of f of x minus f of a as x approaches a is equal to zero. Limit, eh, don't really need the parentheses there. So the limit of f of x minus f of a as x approaches a equals zero. But we add f of a to both sides. We see that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to f of a. Okay, which shows us that it is continuous at x equals a. Okay, so if it's differentiable at x equals a, it is now known that it is continuous at x equals a. Okay. So, since the limit exists at x equals a, we know it is also continuous. Alright, so if you are still writing, feel free to press pause, but we're going to go ahead and move on to our next page. Alright, now we know that if the function is differentiable, it's continuous. But what about if we flip that around? Can we assume that if a function is continuous, that it's also differentiable? Actually, the answer is no, you cannot flip that around. Okay. The reverse is not always true. So in other words, there are functions that are continuous but not differentiable. Okay. Okay. So let's look at an example where that is actually the case. 
Okay, so let's say show whether f of x equals the absolute value of x is continuous and or differentiable at x equals zero. All right. So just to start off, we're going to look at a graph of our function. So draw our x and y axis. X, we have our y, and our absolute value of x looks kind of, sort of, somewhat like that. f of x equals the absolute value of x. Okay, so if you remember from our proof, Continuous. In order for it to be continuous, it just means that the limit of f of x as x approaches a equals f of a. Then we know that it's continuous at whatever a happens to be. All right. So I have a little side note there in a second. So we have the limit of f of x, which is absolute value of x, as x approaches a, or a is zero in this case, equals, if you use direct substitution, that's just the absolute value of zero. Now for our little note here, we know that f of x equals absolute value of x. So that means f of 0 equals the absolute value of 0. So our absolute value of 0 is f of 0. Okay, so we can see that it is continuous. Okay, now we have to check and see if it's differentiable. Okay, so to show differentiability, we know that the limit of f of x, well, what I'll do is x plus h minus f of x all over h as h approaches 0 to the left is equal to the limit of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h as h approaches 0 from the right. Okay, so remember, you can use this for your limit. You can use f of x minus f of a all over x minus a. Same concept. Okay, now we look at when x is approaching 0 from the right. I'm just starting with that one because it's a little easier to understand. Approaching it from the left can get a little bit tricky, so we're starting with the right. Okay, so let's say when x is greater than 0. Okay, so when x is a positive number, the absolute value of x is equal to x. So if you have the absolute value of 3, it's equal to 3. The absolute value of 7 is equal to 7. The absolute value of 31 is equal to 31. As long as it's positive, it's just going to equal x. And that lets me know that the absolute value of x plus h is also 0. Of course, that's when it's close to 0. Okay. Now, it doesn't really matter here whether it's close to zero, but it will matter when it's less than. So, just kind of put that note there. All right, so 
that gives us f prime of x is equal to the limit of f of x plus h. This is our f of x plus h. And that's just absolute value of x plus h. So the absolute value of x plus h minus your f of x, your f of x is just absolute value of x. All over h as h approaches 0 from the right. All right. Now we see here that the limit as h approaches 0 from the right, our absolute value of x plus h, if it's they're both positive, the x is positive and the h is positive, then we know that's just going to be x plus h. So it's x plus h minus your absolute value of x is equal to x all over h. All right, so we see here that x plus h minus x, the x and minus x cancel each other out. So that gives you the limit, let me bring that up some, as h approaches 0 from the right of h over h. Okay, well actually this just becomes the limit as h approaches 0 from the right of 1. So the limit of a constant is just that constant which is equal to 1. Okay, so this shows when x is greater than 0. And if you are still writing, feel free to press pause. We're running out of room, so we're going to go ahead and move this on to the next page. All right, let me bring this down. All right, so now we look at when x is negative, or when you're approaching 0 from the left. Okay, so this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Your absolute value of x is equal to negative x. Okay, now if you're looking at it and going, huh, what are you talking about? Okay, this is... What I mean by that, hopefully this will help it make sense. So let's say if we look at the absolute value of negative 3. Your x in here is equal to negative 3. Okay. So if you have the absolute value of negative 3, so if x is equal to negative 3, the absolute value of negative 3 equals the negative of negative 3, which is equal to positive 3. So the absolute value of negative 3 is equal to 3. So when x is less than 0, your x is equal to the negative of that x value. But it'll come out positive. Okay? And we also know that the absolute value of x plus h when it's really, really, really close to zero, is equal to negative x plus h. So that also will be negative. Okay, so let's look at our derivative. That's equal to the limit as h approaches zero uh -oh, from the left. Keep put that right down there by mistake. There we go. And that's f of x plus h. The absolute value of x plus h. Minus absolute value of x all over h. Okay, those are the same as before. Okay, the only difference is limit at h approaches 0 from the left. The absolute value of x plus h is negative x plus h minus your absolute value of x is equal to negative x all over h. Okay, so it changes up just a little bit. Right, so if we distribute that negative, that's equal to the limit as h approaches 0 from the left of negative x 
minus h plus x all over h. Alright, so that's equal to the limit as h approaches 0 from the left. These two will cancel out. So you have negative h over h. Or just the limit as h approaches 0 from the left. That becomes just negative 1. And the limit of a constant is just that constant. Okay. So, if you look back on the previous page, I'm just going to cover this up for a second. The limit as you approach, as h approaches 0 from the right, is equal to 1. But the limit as h approaches 0 from the left is equal to negative 1. So, we know that it doesn't exist at 0. Since limit h approaches 0 from the left does not equal the limit as h approaches 0 from the right f prime of 0 does not exist so move that up some that tells us that f of x equals absolute value of x is not differentiable at x equals 0. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean it's not differentiable at other points. It just means it's not differentiable at that particular point. Okay, so quick note. f of x equals absolute value of x is differentiable at every other point. It's just at zero when you run into this little snag. All right. So if you are still writing, feel free to press pause. But we're going to go ahead and move on to the next page. Okay. So you're probably wondering. How a function. Can fail. To be differentiable. Okay. There are three ways to tell whether or not a function can be can fail to be differentiable. Okay. Now the first one we do with the example we just did. Okay. So we saw with f of x equals the absolute value of x that a graph with a sharp corner okay so in other words if it just changes direction abruptly changes direction abruptly, uh -oh, does not have a tangent at that point. It does not have a tangent at that point and is not differentiable. Okay, so for example, we just saw with the absolute value of x. Okay. It's not differentiable at that point. Or, let's say if you have a graph that looks like, let's say you have your x and you have your y. If it goes up like this, then just changes 
abruptly like that. Okay. It's not differentiable at that point. Let's say this value, that's your x equals a. Or it could be x equal any number. At that particular point, it's not differentiable. It could be differentiable everywhere here. It could be differentiable everywhere here. It just will not be differentiable at that point. Okay, so whenever you have that sharp corner, it's not differentiable. Okay, so now let's look at the second way to tell whether or not a graph is differentiable. Okay, so if a function is not continuous, then it is not differentiable. At that point. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and do a quick proof of that one using what they call proof by contraposition. Okay, so using proof by contraposition. And that states that if A is true, then B is true. What that really means, or not really means, but it can also mean if B is not true, then A is not true. All right, so if we apply that to our little rule here, what that means is that if F is differentiable, then F is continuous, so that's your differentiable is your A and continuous is your B, that is the same as saying, move that up a little bit, if F is not continuous, then your function f is not differentiable. All right, so we're running out of room. So if you are still writing, feel free to press pause. But we're going to go ahead and finish this up on the next page. Okay, so number three is if the graph has a vertical tangent. at x equals a. Okay, so we would then know it's not differentiable at that point. So let's say, for example, if we have our x, y axis, I'm just going to go ahead and draw that here. And our graph kind of looks like this and it goes straight down and it picks back up. Okay, so you can see here your slope is going up 
And even here, your slope is going up, and even here, your slope is at zero. But you can see around this point here, it's just vertical. Your slope is straight up and down. So let's say that's your x equals a. Nope, you got my x and your y. Okay, so whenever you have a perfectly vertical tangent, we know that it's not differentiable at that point. Vertical tangent line. <coughs> All right. So if you are still writing, feel free to press pause. And actually, this is one of the rare instances where you can actually put your pencil down because I'm going to show you quite a few. I guess you could say problems where you'd have to figure out where it's continuous and everything else, where it's differentiable. But because there are so many, I'm not going to write each one out individually. I've already solved them and I'm just going to show you how and why they were solved. So you don't have to write anything, so you can actually put your pencil down. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and keep going. All right, so. C here wants to know which of the following functions shown below is differentiable at x equals 3. Okay. Okay, so you see all of the options here. Here you see it's not differentiable at 3 because it has a vertical tangent. Okay, you see here it is differentiable at 3 because it's continuous. See here, it's not differentiable at 3 because it has a sharp corner. And you see here, it's not continuous at x equals 3. So it's not differentiable. So that's why this one is differentiable. Okay? So we're going to go ahead and move on to the next one. Okay? Why is the function shown below not differentiable at x equals negative 1? Okay. So you can see here, it's not a vertical tangent line. A vertical tangent line would just be if the function went straight down. Okay. Horizontal tangent line doesn't mean anything because that just shows that the tangent is 0. It has a corner or sharp corner at that point. Okay, so at negative 1, x equals negative 1, it has that sharp corner. Okay, now if they ask for any other x value other than negative 1, you'd be okay. But because it has that sharp corner at negative 1, it's not differentiable. Being smooth at the point wouldn't make a difference because if it's smooth, that's what you want. You want it to be smooth and continuous and differentiable. Okay, it's not, it's continuous, so you can't say it's not continuous because it's not an open circle there. The circle is actually closed, so it is continuous. Okay, and actually if it is, if it was continuous, you'd be okay. It actually is continuous. All right, let's go on to the next one. And this is why I did these ahead of time, because I wanted to go through as many as possible to hopefully show you enough examples without burning through an extra half hour. So you see these examples, hopefully it'll make sense. Okay, why is this one not differentiable at x equals zero? You can see it's zero, it's not continuous. It's a piecewise function that starts here, then picks up there. It's not continuous at x equals zero. Okay, it's not a vertical tangent line, of course. Horizontal tangent line wouldn't really make a difference. It's not a sharp corner at that point, it actually separates. If it's smooth at the point, that would be okay. Being continuous at the point would also be okay. All right. All right, so now let's look at what do derivatives tell us about the function? Okay. 
we know that they tell us what an instantaneous rate of change of a function is at a specific point. If the first derivative is large, then the function changes fast. If the derivative is small, then it changes slowly. But what does the sign tell you? Okay, let's look at this graph. Okay, well, this one. I'll try to get as much of this in here as possible. We see here that our function is decreasing at point A. Okay, at point A, our graph is from left to right, our graph is going down. So we know that it's decreasing. So we know our derivative at point A is negative. We see at point B that it's a horizontal slope. It's going from left, it doesn't go up, it doesn't go down, it's just a flat point. Okay, so we know that f prime of b is equal to zero. Okay, and we see that at point c that our slope is going up. Okay, so we know that f prime of c is positive. Okay, so if you remember just from your basic graphing, if you have an upward slope if it's going up and to the right, it's positive. If it's going down and to the right, it's negative. And if your slope is just going straight across, it's a zero slope. Okay, so here you have your downward slope, your zero slope, and your upward slope. Okay, so if it's positive, your f prime of a is positive. Well, or you have prime of x. F prime of x is zero. All right, so let's look at the next one. All right, so given the graph, what is the interval where f prime of x is negative? Okay, remember, f prime of x is negative when your graph is decreasing. Okay, so as x gets bigger, your graph is decreasing. So actually, your f prime of x is negative from 0 to infinity. So if x equals 0, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger, that's going to just keep staying negative. All right, so let's look at the next one. Okay, so looking at the graph, what is the sign of f prime of x at a? So at a, f prime of x is positive, because remember at point a, your slope is going up and to the right. All right, so I'm kind of fill that in a little more. There we go. So your slope is going up and to the right, so it's positive. Now, if you had a point here, B, it would be going down and to the right, so it would have been negative. But here, it's up and to the right. All right, let's look at the next one. Okay, so if you have your function, over what interval is it positive? Okay, so if you notice here, this is f of x equals x to the third power. It goes up and to the right throughout the whole thing. Okay, so this one it actually has a positive derivative on the entire interval, so from negative infinity to infinity. Okay, so the points where it's negative, you see here it has a negative slope from negative infinity all the way down to negative one. Okay, so we're looking at where it's negative. You see it's positive between negative 1 and 2. Okay, but you see it's negative again from 2 all the way to positive infinity. So that's why these two would be the intervals where your f prime of x is negative. Because it's negative from here and it's negative here. 
All right, let's look at the next one. Okay, so looking at f prime of negative two on this graph, because that's what we're looking at, what is f prime of negative two, just based on the graph, they give you two points. You have your x, f of x, and your x plus h, f of x plus h. So you have your x, f of x, x plus h, f of x plus h. Okay, which is the limit f of x minus f of x plus h minus f of x all over x plus h. Actually, that may be a little. Okay, x plus h minus x as h approaches zero. Okay, so here you have the limit of f of x plus h, which is 5, minus f of x, which is 1, so you have 5 minus 1, over x plus h, which is 0, minus x, which is negative 2. So you have the limit of 4 over 2, so the limit of 2 is just 2. Okay, so if you're given just a graph and we're asked to find the derivative at that point, then you can just use this. All right, so just a couple more. Just want to make sure everything is understood. Okay, so what if they wanted you to actually graph the derivative? So if you wanted to graph the derivative just based off the function, you'd have to look at all the little things that we pointed out earlier. Okay, so what do we know about this graph? We know that f prime of x is equal to zero at x equals negative 2 and x equals 3. So at x equals negative 2, you have a zero slope. It just goes a point from left to right. It's not going up. It's not going down. Okay. Now, what do we also know? We know that the derivative is negative from this point. So from negative infinity to negative 2, it's negative. And we also know it's negative from 3 to infinity. Okay, so all those two intervals are where the slope is going down. And we know that your derivative is positive between negative 2 and 3. Okay, so if you write down those three things, you can actually sketch your derivative. Okay, so if we move this up, looking at those three things, this is how we sketch our derivative. Okay, so we know f prime of x is 0 at negative 2 and positive 3. So you just go ahead and you see I kind of messed up on my drawing, had to erase it. So at negative 2 and 3, that's where you draw your f prime of x is equal to 0. Okay, so now f prime of x is negative from negative infinity to negative 2. So we'd see that it's below 0 from negative infinity to negative 2. And then again from 3 to infinity. It will be, because remember, this is your positive f of x, this is your negative. And we see that it's positive from x equals negative 2 to x equals 3. So it will be above the x-axis between those two points. And we'll see it be below the x-axis for those two intervals. And it will be right on the x-axis when it's equal to 0. So between the interval, between negative 2 and 3, it's positive. So our f prime of x will look something like this. Okay, this is probably kind of the trickier one, so it'll take a little bit of practice. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Remember, you can always go back and look at these again, and if they didn't make any sense, hopefully looking at them a second time will click. All right, so next one. Okay, you want to identify the graph of f prime of x. So they give you your f of x. And just like before, we see where our f prime of x is equal to 0, which is at negative 4. Okay, we see where our slope is positive from negative infinity to negative 4. 
and we see it's negative. And I didn't put that down, but let me write that. F prime of x is less than zero on negative four to infinity. There we go. Okay, so now we look at the look for the graph of our derivative. Okay, but as you can see here, I've already kind of pointed it out because your f prime of x is what? It's zero at x equals negative four. So at x equals negative four, it's zero. It's positive from negative infinity to four. So from negative infinity to four, it's above the x-axis. So it's positive. And from negative 4 to infinity, it's negative. So you see from negative 4 to infinity, it's below the x-axis, so it's negative. Okay. So if you look at your original graph, and you look at all the little details of it, remember where it equals 0, where your slope is equal to 0, where your slope is positive, and where your slope is negative, you can figure out how to graph or pick the graph of your derivative, f prime of x, basically. All right, let's look at a couple more. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So again, let's see the graph of f prime of x. Okay, we can see f prime of x equals 0 at x equals negative 3 and x equals 1. And I forgot to put that down again. f prime of x is less than 0 from negative 3 to negative 1, or negative 3 to 1. There we go. Okay, so now, since we know this is our f of x, and we know all the little details about it, where it equals 0, f prime of x equals 0 here and here, we know it's positive on this interval and this interval, which is negative infinity to negative 3 and 1 to infinity, and we know it's negative from this interval right there. Okay, so now we just look for the graph that meets all of these functions, which we can see is right here. We can see that it's equal to zero at negative three and one. So we have negative three and one, it's on the x-axis. We can see it's above the x-axis from negative infinity to negative three and from one to infinity. It would see is below the x-axis between negative 3 and 1. All right, so let's do one more. Okay, and again, graph of f prime of x. This is your f of x here. But in this case, you actually just needed that 1 to pick it because... All the others kind of canceled out, but I'll fill in the rest. F prime of x is greater than 0 from negative 1 to 4. And f prime of x is less than 0. Yeah, from negative infinity to negative 1. And you have from 4 to infinity. All right, so once again, we look for all of our traits of a derivative, which is basically your slopes. And we see here that f prime of x equals 0 at negative 1 and 4. So you have negative 1 and 4. And you see where your slope is positive from negative 1 to 4, so it'll be above the x-axis from negative 1 to 4, and you see it will be below the x-axis at negative infinity to negative 1, so you have negative infinity to negative 1, and from 4 to infinity, 4 to infinity. Okay, so now you see why I kind of did them ahead of time, because if I would have gone through all of these and wrote them out at the same time, it would have taken longer, so I figured you can always go back and review them you didn't quite get it. Okay, so 
Hopefully you did get it. Hopefully this all made sense and I will see you on the next video.